Hello, and welcome to Attracting and Hiring a Diverse Workforce. Um, I am Elizabeth Finlayson. I am the CEO and lead coach of the, the Nonprofit Coach. My mission is to create a fairer, more equitable, and inclusive world filled with empathy and beauty. And my team and I do this by supporting nonprofit clients with strategic planning and fundraising training and support. So with that, I am so happy to welcome our guests. Holly and Travis from RiseKit. I'm really excited for them to share their expertise and what they've been creating in um, the workforce world. I think it fits a couple of different ideas here. One, um, how important it really is to be attracting and hiring good talent. And I think this is something that many nonprofits struggle with, as well as um, the anti-racism initiatives that we have here. So I'm just going to turn this over to Holly and Travis to introduce themselves and to take it away. Since I'm first on the slide, I guess I'll start here. Uh, my name is Holly Mashanga. As you can see, I'm the marketing manager here at RiseKit. Um, I was really excited when Elizabeth reached out to have us um, present on this webinar. Um, I'm very interested in creating a world or helping to create a world that is more anti-racist and more inclusive and more equitable um, because that's when we all rise and that's when we all have better lives. And so that's why I'm here. Travis? Great. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having us. Uh, really excited to you know have a conversation with everyone here, uh, You know, share both um, some key um, statistics um, and how, you know, basically changing the way that you approach uh, hiring and, you know, building a diverse and representative uh, uh, team can impact your organizations, but also sharing, you know, from our perspective at Rise Kit and what we're learning, helping uh, employers to uh, find more job ready uh, candidates from uh, diverse communities. Uh, and so just a bit about background, the most recent future, Mr. Boster knows, uh, spent a lot of time at Network for Good, really helping a lot of uh, um, uh, leaders at small nonprofit agencies uh, become better fundraising, uh, become better fundraisers and better fundraising organizations. Uh, so really excited now I've moved over to the program side. So, you know, helping more of your workforce and economic mobility groups, you know, improve uh, their, their programmatic work uh, to help more of the individuals that they serve both, you know, get, become more job ready, but, you know, find uh, great uh, entry level positions uh, into careers. And so I thought before we just go around here, because it is a smaller group, uh, so, you know, no real reason for this to be 100%, you know, sort of presentation uh, and, you know, looking for your guys' questions and or feedback. Um, and so, but I also just want to do a quick uh, round of introductions for um, uh, folks that are here and just also kind of better understand what motivated you to show up today. I know you have a lot going on in your day. Uh, so just really curious what you're hoping to get out of it. Uh, Mr. Foster, I'll pass it over to you if you want to introduce yourself and uh, let us know what motivated you or drove you to hop on the call today. Sure, thank you, and uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Travis, I, I changed my name uh, from Matthew to Herbert a few months ago, just so you know that. Okay, I was wondering. Uh, the, the, the Mr. Foster thing is, I'll leave that for my dad. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> We, uh, I work, I'm the development director at Rocky Mountain Youth Corps. We are a youth development organization. It's a, we're an AmeriCorps program. We engage youth and young adults and uh, providing them a paid opportunity to get life skills training and workforce development credentials. Uh, we um, organize them into small crews and they go out into the forest and build trails and do forest restoration work and uh, a number of kind of environmental conservation projects in partnership with uh, the federal government, state government, tribal government, and uh, we help them kind of develop a path towards a career uh, through this experience. Uh, we have a lot of turnover in uh, the uh, program coordinator and program manager position uh, just about every year. Um, the, the individuals who take these positions are usually in their like mid 20s, maybe early 30s, maybe have an idea, they may, they may have a, a, a bachelor's degree, they have a few years of experience in conservation or youth development and some element of our program. Uh, they come in, they get about a year of experience at Rocky Mountain Youth Corps and then inevitably they leave. And it's a really critical position for us. Um, and we just have an excessive amount of turnover uh, in, in that position. 
And we are also very much embracing uh, a, a diverse workforce. We recruit core members uh, for their diversity, um, but we also are taking a close look at our organization and uh, the internal structure and, and how we are composed and how we are attracting and retaining a diverse workforce. And plus, um, I know Elizabeth and Travis and respect them a lot and uh, thought this would be a really worthwhile um, a way to spend some time. Well, I appreciate that. It's great to see you again. Um, and uh, Julie. Hello, um, I'm Julie Goldstein. I am uh, a friend of uh, Elizabeth's and um, we've done some work together in the personal and professional development uh, world. Um, I'm a physician by background and I work for the 10th largest healthcare organization in the country as a um, director of a program called Advanced Care Planning and Shared Decision Making in Serious Illness. Um, and it's a program that I am, have been developing for the last several years. Um, uh, I am about to make my second hire and this one is a big one. Um, and uh, I think in, uh, within the next year or two, we'll be making a whole lot more hires. Um, I really, you know, the, the, there is a process inside my organization and a requirement for a diverse slate, et cetera. And um, I have yet to uh, know, you know, in detail how that works, but I want, I really want my team to represent the community that we're uh, working with. And um, so I figured any knowledge that I can glean uh, even outside of what the, the process is within my organization would be useful. So thanks for having me. Great, yeah, thanks for, thanks for going, joining us. And Jeffrey. You're on the hot seat now, sir. Hot seat. Okay, so uh, I'm a management consultant. I have, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the topic because I do work with startups and scale-ups. Um, diversity, equity, inclusivity are part of what we, how we measure value. And at the end of the day, I have a separate, uh, project that I started with Elizabeth, and that's focused on designing sustainable communities. Mm. So all of this goes hat in hand. I'm doing some work with a small education organization that is trying to ensure that they have uh, tutors and volunteers that are sensitive to cultural and uh, racial concerns, as well as awareness around the growing challenges that are impacting young people with respect to um, um, trauma. And unfortunately, uh, it, it, it's the stuff with COVID that we're dealing with is, it has its own impact as it relates to trauma <clears throat> and our ability to relate to people that are dealing with that, the sensitivity, a lot of the things that we understand from various uh, psycho testing and so forth uh, that help us understand the other side of the, of the fence. You know, it's part and parcel of it. A lot of it's NLP type training that gets incorporated to those assessments and developing a better understanding about where we are, what kind of culture we want to embody in an organization to create better leadership. And that's all part of, you know, really creating sustainable growth. Yeah. And so that's really what draws me to this because, you know, the old story from uh, Trucker is, uh, you know, if you don't have the right culture, it's going to eat strategy for lunch. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, no, that's a good point and kind of uh, a great way to transition in just to kind of level setting where we're coming from um, in our perspective as well. And so uh, if you're unfamiliar, Rise Kit um, helps individuals from underserved communities find and stay in fulfilling career pathways. And so we really do that in two different ways. And so we help out in that first step in the process. And so uh, if an individual, whether they are coming from a, a reentry population or they're just coming from uh, an opportunity or an underserved community, and they're looking to say like, you know, I'm ready to, you know, find and stay in a fulfilling career, you know, and trying to change. Uh, that first step can be incredibly difficult and complex 
And oftentimes it's the wrong step, you know, which basically just leads to them not wanting to continue to pursue um, their original motivation. And so we help them to make sure that they can get connected with the either the right employment opportunity dependent upon their existing skill sets, or we help to get them into a, a workforce uh, program. Uh, on the other side, we really help to build better workforce programs um, by providing them technology that improves uh, on the user experience and the user experience being the client, community member, whatever their particular term is for the individual who participates in their programs, uh, helping to build the capacity of their frontline program staff. So the individuals that are working really hand in hand with their clients uh, and then providing the leadership with you know, better insights to inform how to improve um, staff performance, but also how to improve uh, programmatic outcomes. Um, and so from that, from that vantage point, what we're also doing a lot of is working with employers and you know, trying to help both workforce uh, programs uh, as well as also individuals get connected with uh, employers that have entry level positions open, but ultimately we're kind of helping them to overcome some initial biases uh, that exist, and whether that's in you know, resumes or um, communication skills, you know, any number of uh, issues or barriers basically that get in the way of helping uh, them to develop a more diverse and representative um, employer base. And then we also come at it from the vantage point of, you know, like any organization, we ourselves are trying to make sure that, you know, our uh, employee base is representative of the community that we serve. We're trying to make sure we're inclusive, you know, we're just navigating the same waters that many of you were trying to navigate yourselves in your own organizations. So those are some going to be some of the anecdotes and positions that we share today, uh, in addition to, you know, just sharing some, you know, basic uh, stats and key points um, as well, so that you're kind of uh, armed with both, okay, uh, ideas from our own vantage point and what we're kind of learning in, alongside a lot of our uh, people in our community, in addition to do just some of the things that we're looking at and researching and, you know, to inform like how we're, how, what, what, what approach we should be taking as well. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Holly, who is going to get us started here. Before I get started, Diana, we missed you on introductions. Do you want to go ahead and give oh. an introduction real quick? That's all right, no problem. Um, I'm Diana Clegg with um, Third Side Consulting, uh, I'm a nonprofit management consultant. I've been doing some uh, work with Elizabeth lately. And I, um, so that's how I heard about this and I was able to participate, but it's also a, a passion of mine to doing anti-racism work and looking at how to make uh, workplaces more equitable and diverse. So I care both personally and professionally. So thanks. Perfect. And so I'll kick this off. Um, like Travis was saying, we're coming from, you know, our personal experiences and the way that we've been navigating the world. I can only speak as, you know, my own physician. So I'm excited to talk to you all today. Um, and so the first question that we're going to cover today is around what are the advantages of hiring outside of your network? And Elizabeth, you can get to the next screen for me. So a lot of these advantages are really around increasing your hiring pool and making sure that you are getting the best of the best for your company. Um, there's kind of an analogy that I found around making sure that when you hire someone and you've only hired from a group of 10, and you get someone who is in the 90th percentile of that group of 10, then they're only the best of 10 people. They're not the best of a thousand, they're not the best of 10,000. So you don't know that you are getting the best person for your organization. So you end up paying the same amount of money for this person is probably do like two thirds of the productivity of, the, of another person that you would have found if your hiring pool was just a bit bigger. And going outside of your network means that you're going outside of that realm of thought, that realm of the echo chamber that you may have found yourself in. And so that is the first reason um, why a bigger hiring pool is better for your organization. And then secondly, as we all know, and as we've seen, you know, this year, last year, and the years before, really, um, around how critical diversity is. If you even look kind of on, from a consumer perspective, if you only look at the um, fashion week faux pas that we've seen, like fashion brands putting together different kind of um, culture it looks, but they didn't know that maybe a portion that they used was like offensive or something like that. And that's something that could be avoided if they had a diverse pool of people working on that campaign. Um, and so a couple of stats around that, um, when people are looking for a job, they are all like 67% of job seekers are using the diversity of the 
company that they're trying to join to see if they're going to join in the first place. I know that when I was job seeking last year, um, when I was looking and applying for companies, I wanted to see if I saw more people who looked like me, who more people who were thinking like me, just to see like if I wasn't going to be the only or the only person there. Um, and so, and secondly, a diverse team is a better team. It just is a factual is a factual point that a diverse team is a better team because you catch things that you wouldn't have known before. And Travis and I we work closely all the time, um, and there are many things that he catches that I don't, and there are many things that I catch that he doesn't. And it is because we both come from two different backgrounds that we can have those two pieces of diverse pieces of thought. Um, and then lastly, you know it just leads to a better company dynamic and less legal troubles. I believe Jeffrey might've said this, that, you know, um, culture eats strategy for dinner. And so like, if you have a culture of diverse people who are able to take your strategy to that next level, that means you are avoiding like any of those kind of pitfalls that your strategy might've had before you had that diverse thought in there. And so that are my top, those are my top three reasons why increasing your diversity of your hiring pool is important. And so I wanted to kind of ask you all, you know, why do you think that you should increase your hiring pool to kind of bring in more diverse pieces of thought? Like what, what is the hole that you're filling or that kind of deal? So I just wanted to ask that to the crowd. I think if, you know, one thing I'd like to ask or state in here that I've seen is not only for nonprofits, um, a lack of diversity sometimes, um, you know, around like race or ethnicity or sometimes like people being, if you looked at the overall numbers, it looks like it's diverse. But if you looked at what types of jobs people were in, it wasn't. I've also noticed like people hiring you know, an entire organization of type A people in which, for instance, like there wasn't somebody who could flex or there wasn't somebody who could do a different type of role or everybody was like, literally once I was on a team where all, it was like a bunch of young white women with brown curly hair, like, like literally hiring the almost the same person every time. And what I have seen is that people um, tend to hire people because there's fear. We don't know who this person is. Like you're like proposing marriage on date three we tend to hire people that are like ourselves. So I guess a question I have for you guys is what are the like facts or statistics or tools that people can use when they're walking into something, just not knowing and going, Oh, I'm just going to grab this person that kind of remind me of me at that age. You know, I know they'll be great. You know, which is maybe sometimes I think how people make hiring decisions. So let me, let me throw in a couple points, Holly, and maybe this is helpful. Um, one of the challenges I find with most companies, small or large, is the inability to clarify what their needs are for a given role. A lot of times they're trying to replace somebody with another somebody, which is what Elizabeth is talking about. And at the same time, they also struggle with trying to deal with complexity and change because what happened yesterday isn't what's going to happen tomorrow. It's not like the, there's, there's no pattern to this. And so if you have to be in a new world of products and services and meeting customer needs that are constantly changing and you keep hiring the same people, well, that's not going to get you real far. So that it's really on both ends of it. That's true. That's true. Oh, go ahead, Travis. Oh, I was just going to comment on in into um, what Elizabeth was mentioning, and in part, like it's uh, recognizing that we have biases as humans, you know, and so we will quickly uh, group people or you know see patterns. You know, pattern recognition is you know a big part of what we do um, to determine okay whether or not that person is like me, and you're more likely then to sort of be connected to that person very quickly. And so taking that into account when developing your hiring processes, uh, taking that into account when, you know, looking through your resumes, you know, things like something as a zip code or a name, you know, we'll get into this a little bit later and, you know, practices to implement, but it, it starts with really both defining what you're looking for, but as well as recognizing that you will have implicit bias, even if you don't consider yourself to have an explicit bias, uh, which is where I think some people, um, uh, uh, kind of stumble on and sort of building building the process from that perspective will lead to hiring more diverse people as well. Yeah. Wanna go to the next slide, Travis? Or unless there are any other, you know, inputs, anything like that? 
All right, let's keep it going. Okay, so the next question is around what are the advantages of hiring people with work history challenges? And we took this question to mean any kind of work history challenges. It could be someone who's in a re-entry population. They might um, have less education or maybe they have um, come against a couple of different types of societal barriers um, that are keeping them to getting the career that they'd like. And so Travis is gonna cover that point next. Great, and is there uh, the, the next slide? Got it. Okay. Um, and so I think um, I'm curious in, in any of the jobs that you've had, you know, what has, have you had, have you ever worked somewhere where there was an explicit openness to hiring somebody with a felony? Has anybody ever worked somewhere like that? Um, or have there ever been a conversation in a board meeting that you've had that's like, okay, you know, should we hire, you know, people with criminal backgrounds? And if so, you know, how should we define what we're open to hiring? Got it. Okay, well, that's where to start. Uh, <laughs> if you're uh, in getting into it, whether it's, you know, criminal backgrounds or whether it's, you know, and it gets back to the original point of, you know, you spent a lot of time and energy getting a degree. Uh, and so you find that valuable. Uh, and so it's hard for you to say, I don't find that valuable. I want to hire somebody that doesn't have it. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, we, 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 uh, we try to do that. Um, we like to think that that we look for core members who need us more than we need them for some sort of status quo on diversity. I was thinking of one individual, a uh, young man, while he was a core member, he um, was found guilty of, uh, in, um, of uh, homicide. Um, he, he, was, um, he killed somebody in a car accident from drinking and driving. Wow. And um, I assumed that he would be fired immediately from, from our service. Uh, but the staff decided to keep him on board until uh, he was, you know, for, some, for whatever reason, no longer eligible to work because that alone with our, and our internal policies did not exclude him. Uh, and I was really surprised by that. And he turned out to um, you know, really continue his service and had a lot of respect uh, and acceptance from, from his uh, coworkers. So um, we have gone out of our way to um, accept, you know, people who yep. you're, like you're talking about. That's a great story. And in, uh, at that, has that started a bigger conversation at, at, um, at Rocky Mountain just about it? Well, maybe it's not that scary. Uh, and however it's framed, um, in seeing that success, has that kind of changed a bit of the culture or the attitude towards, you know, hiring people with um, criminal backgrounds? Uh, it didn't for me, for sure. Awesome. And I think I think we now have that experience uh, in approaching the next circumstance yeah. when it occurs. And that kind of hits to, you know, education um, and, you know, helping people to overcome their initial bias and, you know, coming up with different ways to do that. And, uh, whether it's in a board setting or managing up to an executive director and, you know, looking for maybe a reentry program locally, you know, where you could have somebody come in and speak and, you know, talk about like, uh, or, you know, come, what are their program participants, you know, kind of to lift uh, the veil, so to speak on, you know, those individuals to help them help, help the people that are ultimately in charge of making decision um, ultimately see that it's not that scary. That they're just like, you know, folks like you and me uh, who have a lot of potential. Um, and so, you know, part of that gets into like the loyalty component, uh, you know, an individual and you see this a lot of the, uh, we work with a lot of reentry programs, uh, you know, they when they're coming out oftentimes in prison and they're going into these reentry programs, you know, they're really committed to being successful. They want to be in their children's lives. You know, they thought a lot about what life is going to be like on the outside. And, you know, they're really just focused on, you know, how do I find, you know, um, uh, gainful employment, you know, how do I get my self-worth back almost is really what they're looking for. Uh, and so if you're also looking to hire from these populations too, it, it gets back to developing relationships with your local reentry programs is a great place to start because um, those could be great sources of uh, new hires as well. And so there's both the internal barrier you know, once you get over that and then looking to develop partnerships with local groups and other nonprofit agencies uh, so that you can get access to, um, you know, job ready or qualified, you know, individuals. And so reducing at least some of the risk, uh, even if it's just from the perception 
is a great way to do it. Uh, a different perspective. Um, I, and, and to be perfectly candid, I have my own uh, you know, criminal background, which gives me a lot of perspective and a lot of work that we do. I'm really the only criminal, criminal connected person or justice connected person that's on our team. And so that gives me a vantage point that, you know, nobody else on our team has when, you know, discussing how we're going to, you know, develop, you know, better processes or how we're going to approach, you know, serving this group and particularly at a nonprofit agency. And if you're working with a, a largely, um, uh, low income community uh, with diverse populations, you're definitely dealing with a lot of justice connected people. And so if you're really wanting to make sure like, do we, are, do we have any biases? Are we approaching this in the right way? Then you wanna have somebody at the table that actually has that experience. So having that different perspective will ensure that your programmatic work, you know, is, uh, um, uh, I'd say makes sense. And so there's also just uh, the work opportunity tax credit. And so you could actually get paid and it's not just people with uh, ex-felons, but there's all different types of people um, that if you hire them, there's actually tax credits that you could have uh, to reduce some of that risk. Because a lot of times, some of the pushback that we get on hiring um, uh, 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 criminally connected or justice connected people is like, what if they steal from me? What, basically, I have a liability now for hiring this person. And so this is a way to, uh, to, to get around that objection. So if your board member says something like, well, I don't want to hire this. I don't want to hire people because, you know, it's a liability in our end. You know, that's an opportunity to come back and be like, well, you know, it, there's definitely a risk, you know, and oftentimes like at some point if that, at some point that person didn't have a criminal record and they ended up committing the criminal, <laughs> criminal act. So it's really hard to gauge, you know, just based upon the criminal uh, record, but there's also these tax credits reduce some of the at least financial risk that, so it's just a tool to have to push back on board members, executive directors, whoever ultimately is, you know, going to be in charge of, uh, determining whether or not you'll make this part of your policy. Um, Can just getting a larger question. Yeah, of course. Um, it's interesting to talk about this because there is a, there is a, there is an institutional stigma about people that have committed a crime. Oftentimes the people that are committing crime, especially in low income environments have done it a person to person. However, when you talk about white collar crime or higher income level crimes, those typically impact many people, not always. And those kinds of, if you will, criminals have, have impacted many people's lives. And the, the question is, we treat them with a different perspective and bias mm -hmm. than somebody who does something that impacts maybe one or two people. Yep. And so that's part of the challenge. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Um, and I think kind of thinking about the impact, it gets into the better for your community aspect as well. Uh, and so if you're, if particularly from a nonprofit's perspective, and if you're helping an individual who's, you know, reentering society or, you know, just have a criminal background, you, you providing them with that chance, you know, actually has a much bigger impact on everyone that they're connected with. And so it's, it, it one, it reduces the likelihood that they ultimately end up going back to prison, you know, which you know, connects or impacts their immediate family. And there could likely be another, um, uh, a, a crime that could be committed, but also by providing that somebody with an opportunity, it also shows the people around him that, you know, you can actually succeed. And, you know, there's people out there hiring people with backgrounds that you don't have to be as, you don't have to be afraid, you know, to go out there and put yourself out there to try to get a job. Um, but there's a much bigger impact, you know, when you hire, you know, an individual than just, you know, hiring them. And it does really uh, uh, kind of uh, impact their sort of uh, their community as well. And so it just gets back to be like living, kind of living your values as a nonprofit agency. If any, if there is an organization that you know should be more focused on living their values, you know it's definitely nonprofit agencies. Um, but this also gets into just hiring people who don't have formal uh, degrees as well, and thinking about like what are the requirements for our entry level positions. You know, does it really require that four year degree, or you know, could somebody without it, you know, perfectly do the job perfectly, or do the job well enough, and we can help to train them. And so opening yourself up to a wider applicant pool, you know, whether it's around criminal backgrounds, whether it's around formal education, uh, ultimately could lead to, you know, hiring uh, great employees. Um, but it does come with at least perceived risks that you're going to have to work to manage. Um, and we always like to think internally and in just a way to, uh, to kind of articulate the story for uh, justice connected people. And that often, you know, we talk about second chance hiring, but in many instances, it's really their first chance. Uh, you know, while yes, everybody has, uh, 
everybody has their own their, their ability to make their own decisions uh but it, it's it's sometimes difficult to make the right decision with all dependent upon the community and the world that you're surrounded with. And so really taking it from, you know, the first chance perspe perspective, I think is a fresh way to look at it uh, and a great way to also help to educate, you know, the decision makers in the organization on, you know, why we're taking this approach and, you know, helping to share stories, you know, about individuals' lives, about people that are um, uh, successful in reentering uh, society, you know, finding employment and the impact that you're having. Um, so there's really, it, it gets back to how do we implement something like this, but there's a lot of opportunities to build that case for support. Um, and, and whether it's working with local agencies and the reentry space, or, you know, just finding uh, stories externally uh, that you could probably find by Google searching, you know, as part of your case uh, to, to, to update your bylaws, to update your policies, to, to be more intentional with the way that you approach hiring people uh, with uh, history challenges. One, one thing that you mentioned, Travis, which I thought was really important is that it, this is an investment in the community. And I don't think it's restricted to just not-for-profits. Small business mm -hmm. is all about community. It's one of the things I'm trying to push for yeah, in the SBAC. That's a really good point. Yeah, it's definitely not um, exclusive to nonprofits. I think that, um, I think that nonprofits are especially, you know, equipped to kind of bring this to their board and things like in, in those kind of instances because in like small businesses you could have a, a certain set of values that like you need to live behind but people are not um they are less likely to throw that in your face and say hey like you're not doing this thing if you're a not-for-profit and you're not you're you're serving this diverse community of people those people also want to see people who look like them um, and so it is important and especially for comfort and being able to come to you for help being able to see someone who looks like you or hear someone who thinks like you or knows their experiences on a more personal level is definitely important in imparting that help and being impactful. Um, and so for this next question around what obstacles do people of color and people with non-traditional backgrounds face, I wanted to ask, you know, what, when you look at your current like hiring process, and I know some of you were talking about how you're starting that hiring process, what does it look like? Do you, is it five steps, like you, someone must meet with five people or they must have like a certain dress code when they come to like the interview, that kind of deal. Like what does that hiring process look for you all now? Okay. Well, I can talk about, uh, for, 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 oh, Mr. Foster, do you have an input? Yeah, sure. I was just going to say we we have uh, we look at the at, at two levels when we hire core members, who are youth and young adults. Often their very first job, oh, they may show up in flip flops and a t-shirt, and um, you know their their email address may be four twenty party boy, <laughs> party girl, um, and or then there's you know the professional more professional staff where the expectation is. Um, uh, you wear a collared shirt and slacks or, you know, uh, a skirt and, and uh, things like that. So there's, um, but I'm happy to say that, that the culture of our organization is, is very open and, and flexible, but there are definitely you know, minimum standards for sure. Yeah, I thought that was uh, the point on the email addresses. It's actually uh, something that we often uh, suggest for workforce programs as one of the first things they update. Uh, just to get a professional Gmail. Uh, and it's, it, 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 yeah, there's definitely an immediate bias uh, if you get a, get a resume from somebody, you know, with a non-professional email. And so that's always something that we uh, highly suggest. It's a good point. Yeah, that's true. But I would like to point out someone has an email from the high school. It means I have longevity. Okay. They kept it with that email for that long. Um, but no, so to answer <laughs> Uh, the question around what kind of obstacles like people of color face with non-traditional -tra non backgrounds. If we can go to that next slide, Elizabeth. Yeah, so uh, this first point around no call, no show. Um, so for people of color who are going into these kind of hiring environments, very often 17% um, of white people get a call back when they have a job interview, but 5% of African-Americans get called back. Women get, 40% um, of black women get called back and 39% of Hispanic women get called back and 23% of white women who were pre previously incarcerated or employed were called back. Um, and so like, it is kind of impossible to get the job if you don't get a call back um, from the person who you're interviewing with. And so it, 
and while this isn't tied to like whatever kind of questions they ask in the interview, whatever biases the interviewer might have, it is just a, it is just a simple fact that um, less people of color are being called back for these positions, so they have less of a chance of getting these positions. And so when you're looking at your hiring practices and you have like this pool of people, making sure that the people that you are bringing back out of the quality of that crop, making sure that you have, you know, a certain percentage of diverse candidates in that pool so that you have more, more likelihood of hearing more of the ideas, more of their, more of the ways that they can contribute to your organization if you're, high, if you're pulling back a bigger pool of diverse candidates in that second callback. Um, and then next around biases, and I know Travis kind of previewed this earlier, because um, bias is a thing that all of us um, deal with every day and in every way. Um, I, I think, so, sorry. So the next the first point, that's sorry, I'm kind of a little ner nervous today, so please excuse my nerves. Um, but the first kind of bias is around the horn effect. Everyone knows about the halo effect. The halo effect is around um, if someone does, if someone is kind of like you, like say if you've met someone in your applicant pool and they went to the same college, same sorority, and um, they seem like they've done the same kind of experiences as you, like you kind of view them already as like this amazing person, regardless of what comes out of their mouth in the interview, whether or not they said the ABCs backwards or whatever, um, you kind of see them as like this angel of sorts, but the horn effect is kind of the opposite. So like if someone's coming into your office and they are um, a returning citizen and you have a bias against someone who is coming back from that kind of environment, then you automatically kind of see their interview answers and the way that they're responding, maybe even the way that they dress in a different light. And so that is something that I think that we should all be aware of when we're interviewing people is kind of going, hey, you know, taking a step back from um, what you've seen on paper and what they've been defined as on paper and kind of assessing the person that you, is in front of you at that point. Um, and then the next thing is around name bias. So my name is Holly Mashanga. Um, my last name is not a name that people um, can say easily. I've won a lot of bets, um, betting people if they can say my last name right the first time. Um, but when I was applying for jobs, I was nervous because I was afraid that my last name, which is um, from the country of Zimbabwe, it might be a little bit too hard for people to respond to and they might not want to, you know, call me back. And so I think that one of the ways that you can kind of avoid that is trying to make sure that maybe when you're sending these resumes to like your team, um, trying to do it blind, like, hey, th this is this per person one's experience, you don't see their name, you don't see it, they don't have a picture on their resume, then like, you don't see any of that, you just see the experience and you choose from there. So that'll help you with around name biases. And then around skin color, the preference generally um, in society is for a lighter skin tone. And so when you when you encounter like darker skinned individuals, they kind of run against that barrier a lot more because people kind of associate darker things with bad things sometimes. It's just kind of a way that we've been conditioned in this society. And so like when you're a darker skinned person, you feel like you need to do um, more <laughs> to get noticed or more to be thought of later. Um, and that's just a bias that kind of exists across the spectrum of people. Um, and then that last part, implicit bias, I'm gonna let Travis take it because he has great points about it. Yeah. And this is a lot of what we're learning as we look to help employers um, identify, you know, um, obstacles or ultimately biases in their hiring process um, ourselves. And so, you know, everything from, you know, doing Zooms without video um, is one way to make sure that you're just having a conversation with somebody just like you would on a phone uh, call and making that your intro calls. And like Holly was saying, removing, you know, names and zip codes, you know, anything that can leave an immediate impression on an individual and the way that they, you know, look at the rest of the information. Um, I mean, we're looking at also like, how do we just get rid of resumes uh, <laughs> just in general, because they're, you know, in part uh, antiquated um, and have been used for so long, but they are one of the biggest barriers for people from underserved communities um, in getting access to jobs. And so uh, that it's just like, why do you, why do I, why should somebody that's looking for an entry level position that doesn't require anything to do with good writing have to be a good writer in order to get the job and doing the resume? And so it's just kind of blowing up a lot of sort of your previous, your existing sort of assumptions in the way that like what you need in order to hire somebody as well. And it's a lot of what we're trying to do in challenging employers to rethink uh, the way they approach hiring. And implicit bias, I think is and in part, it's good for you know me as a cisgender white male, you know, who doesn't you know see myself as having any kind of explicit explicit bias, you know, 
AKA like being racist or, you know, genderist or, you know, looking at anybody different. Um, but off, obviously implicit bias still plays a key role going back to just being humans and, you know, being designed to uh, pattern, like recognize patterns basically, and then draw, you know, quickly and, um, implied assumptions based upon that. Um, and, and it gets back into like, okay, how do I go back to our board who may not think that they have a bias, you know, to try to educate them that they do have a bias. Um, and so there's a lot of great studies uh, that I'm happy to, we can share in follow up. Uh, but the one that I thought was the most um, eye opening for me uh, was it, it's in the book, A Broken Ladder. Um, and it's largely about inequality. It, it was a really great book and it's relatively uh, easy read. And it could be something that you provide, you know, to board members or again, your executive director uh, so that they can read, they can understand. It can be something that you talk about, you know, and kind of break it up um, to give everybody an opportunity to really understand these biases before you start introducing new policy ideas, kind of to get them more receptive to it. Um, but basically it was a study that was done uh, by an individual and it was particularly around uh, police, why ultimately police um, were, were shooting more African-Americans than uh, white individuals. And so what they had done, and if you've ever, if you were in college and you, know, you were you know, getting paid for a psychology study, you may have gone through something similar to this uh, in that they were showing a series of slides and it would be a, a, a black face, a tool or a weapon, white face tool or a weapon, and it would just sort of go through it quickly. Uh, and when, when it was slow, it was relatively easy to pick, you know, which would come after, whether it was a tool or a weapon. But when you begin to speed the slides up, uh, the individual is much more likely to choose um, a, a weapon after seeing a black face than after seeing a white face. And so part of that was, you know, the implicit bias of police officers, even without even knowing it, you know, their reaction was part of that because of that implicit bias that they have. Um, and so it's, I think when you're thinking about that's great. And if your board isn't on board with this and you're really still at that beginning stage of like, I know we need to change, but I need to change the culture and the way that we think about these things, starting with educating them on their own implicit bias can be a great place to start. And I know the Broken Ladder uh, was a great book, but there's also a lot of great studies that you can share. And for me, that was the one that kind of opened my mind or at least uh, was a kind of an aha moment. Not to say I didn't think I didn't have a bias previously, but when I had seen that it was like, yeah, you know, everybody has it regardless of, um, it, it's not, yeah, everybody has some type of implicit bias, whether it's, uh, or explicit one. Um, and so, go ahead, Ali. Yeah, and I would say like, looking at Jeffrey's point, I think that's a great way to think about it, to frame it. It is easier to kind of inform people of the biases that exist in this world and like, like the horn effect or like name biases. And if they know that it exists and they are I feel they are more likely to go, okay, so like I would have looked at this name a different way, but now I know what name bias is. So maybe I should do a different, um, do something differently. Um, instead of saying like, hey, we want you to avoid bias as a blanket term. And it's just hard to know what you don't know. Um, and around this last point around diversity and hiring practices, I know like in nonprofits, everyone wears 17 hats. And so it would be a great idea if you're doing a hiring process and it's just you, maybe bringing in people in your network that have more diverse pieces of thought to have them interview this candidate would also give you like a different um, viewpoint into it. And so therefore you would have a bigger circle, but you have a team of three, you know, so. Yeah, and I would just, one quick point, and I know we're on the, have 13 minutes left, but that's a big place where we've been focusing on recently and just making sure that we have it within our internal hiring process, you know, that there is a diverse group of people that are ultimately hiring them. Yeah, I've liked it, so. <laughs> I love that, the implicit association test. That is, that is amazing. We should definitely send that out later. Um, and then we can go to this next question, Elizabeth. So now we're getting to kind of the tangible things you can do as um, in your organization to kind of attract more diverse candidates and make sure that they come and stay. Um, and so if you wanna to go to that next slide for me, Elizabeth. So my, one of the things I love talking about the absolute most is an act that has been implemented in seven states with 43 to go. It's called the Crown Act. It is, it's an acronym. It's Create a Respectable and Open World for Natural Hair. Um, and it's a piece of legislation that's been introduced by um, largely an African-American group of folks who are just trying to um, prevent 
discrimination for people of curly hair descent um, from being able to wear their hair in the way that they feel. So see Elizabeth, we're, we're in the club, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so like this legislation is around preventing that, that kind of um, discrimination and saying that you can't kind of consider that in your hiring practices. Um, and so that, that, that act is in seven states. And so I believe that in your states in the states that you are in right now, you can kind of bring it to your legislators because it's not something that's not known um, or it might, you might already have like a, a coalition who is looking to get this implemented at your state level so we can get it implemented nationally. That's just an actionable step you can take. So please, please support <laughs> the Crown Act. Um, Illinois, is not one of them. Illinois is, has not been filed or passed. And Georgia, not either. I'm in Atlanta, so we're trying, <laughs> trying down here. Yeah, and I, I think that kind of gets into the second part here. It's like, you don't have to wait for your legislature uh, to change policies <laughs> and to, to force you to do something. And you could quickly do it as your own organization. And if anything, your HR policy, policy should reflect your values as well uh, and something that you document. Uh, and if it doesn't, if you just, you know, like us, you know, getting started, just, you know, typed in HR policy template from the internet, uh, and, and that kind of is how you started with your HR, uh, policy, you know, making sure that you are, you know, um, kind of thinking through it. It is a couple of things here. Uh, and just in my time, you know, particularly working at Network for Good and working with a lot of nonprofits everywhere, you kind of end up with quite a bit of pressure. You know, your board member can suggest and say, hey, you know, I've got a friend, I've got a you know, nephew, I've got a niece, uh, you know, I've got somebody who I think you should be looking at. And, you know, that's in part really a big influence on, you know, your hiring process. Um, and then it's also to a point, you know, is an opportunistic hiring. You only have so much money uh, to pay. And so uh, it kind of puts you in a, a bind uh, sometimes. And so I thought I would just kind of frame this around like formal HR policies and, and thinking more so about and kind of connecting the next two steps to creating a diverse hiring pool and thinking about this from different steps. And so um, like the first step is, you know, looking towards either going to nonprofit agencies who are, have workforce programs uh, in place already, who are helping to get people that are uh, from underserved communities more job ready, you know, maybe not showing up in sandals, uh, in a t-shirt, you know, but uh, at least knowing to show up, you know, with a new Gmail account and, you know, uh, dressed more professionally. Um, and so widening, you know, just the pool of applicants that you're getting in. Um, a big one, we are actually, it's a local Chicago-based workforce program has really been helping us uh, to better understand like how we can help to change employer practices. But your job descriptions then become sort of that next uh, focal point, basically. Like you're getting more people to it, but then you look at your job description and you're using incredibly technical terms that people don't understand. Uh, so like have your partner look at it, you know, have somebody that doesn't understand your business, you know, take a look at it as well. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, sorry. Uh, Siri, uh, it happens so frequently. It's very odd. Um, and, uh, also looking at like going back to like the HR part of it, uh, two key points. If you don't need somebody to have a, a, a bachelor's degree and you've agreed, don't put it on there as preferred. Don't put it on there as required. You know, it's just basically saying that, you know, we want people with X amount of uh, these skills and, uh, you know, maybe this level of experience in the number of years. Um, cause that becomes a, a key reason why, cause so many individuals from underserved communities have imposter syndrome, you know, they don't feel like they belong. And so they're going to be very quick, basically, when looking at your job descriptions to say, this is not for me. Uh, the other one is going to be around criminal records, you know, have that discussion internally, and you know, don't have a box there that somebody just checks, which is somewhat vague. And nobody really knows what you're going to whether or not you're going to hire them and think internally and say, you know what, we have, you know, people who do not feel comfortable having sexual offenders here. And so that's the one one we are just not even going to entertain. And so instead, you know, we are open to second chance hiring and, you know, we, we already did it successfully, but we do not allow people with XYZ records. Uh, and just being very clear and upfront, you know, so that, you know, individuals, one, feel like, okay, they're accepting, they're already doing this. Uh, and, you know, they will ultimately end up applying. So, you know, your job description ends up being like a key filter uh, for, uh, which probably is keeping a lot of great talent out. Um, and then once they're actually in, it's thinking about your policies and the way that you, uh, thinking about the challenges and barriers to sustaining employment that people from underserved communities have. Uh, and so we do a lot on first day 
Uh, and so everything from like knowing where your job is uh, to uh, just simply paying somebody $15 uh, for Lyft for their first day could increase the probability that person shows up on their first day. Uh, and that may be something that you don't ever do. You're like, oh, well, if they can't show up on their first day, you know, then uh, we don't care. Um, but if you're really wanting to commit to hiring from underserved communities, those are some of the things that you'll need to start thinking about because that becomes a really big barrier to people showing up and they'll just kind of give up and they'll feel defeated and they won't do it. Uh, one of the groups that we work with in Dallas has each person like a, a couple of days before and they give them the money, uh, take the bus or drive there and then send a photo of the front door. Uh, just so that she knows they've gone through it, they know, they're confident, they know where it's at. And so that increases sort of their position and the confidence that they're getting there. Uh, the other thing is that one, we also know that um, as a hiring manager, as a one person, you know, chief everything officer, you also don't have the time to be a social worker, um, but also recognizing that everything from, you know, child care to food scarcity to house, uh, to, to housing stability, you know, could have so much uh, impact on individuals. And so if anything, it's um, being more open because uh, oftentimes a lot of particularly women from underserved communities just won't show up to work if they have childcare issues and they won't, and they're, and they're somewhat ashamed you know, of being an embarrassed and they won't ever say anything and they'll never show up again. Um, and so creating a more open environment with people to be more forthcoming um, is really key as well. If you're wanting to hire from uh, diverse or diverse and particularly um, uh, underserved communities. And so it just takes a lot of thinking differently about the way that you do things, being more receptive and open to a lot of the barriers that individuals face when trying to find employment. And then just looking internally about, you know, what can you be doing differently? Uh, to get sort of your board on board, your executive director on board uh, with some updating some of your policies. Um, and one last thing just on the HR policy, um, this could be a great tool uh, and for you to be able to push back on any individual or any, um, if you say like we have to hire at least five people and you know, two, of the, two of the five you know, need to be from diverse backgrounds, uh, gives you a great bar uh, in a way to kind of push back on some individual saying, hey, I've got somebody for the job and you're feeling obligated to hire them. And so it gives you something to fall back on to say, hey, it's in our bylaws, it's part of HR policy, we've got to interview at least five people and two from diverse backgrounds. So maybe I have only uh, worked with uh, people with dysfunctional boards. And so that's something you guys don't have to worry about, but <laughs> that's, <laughs> that could just be my own bias uh, in a lot of my uh, work with, you know, particularly small nonprofits, but, you know, it's something that uh, you could use as a, a, a way to kind of um, uh, to, to expand the conversation and push back on some of these things, which could push you into, you know, ultimately not representing your values and hiring, not hiring people from diverse backgrounds. Many, yeah. many, many boards are comprised of people that come from <clears throat> uh, less than optimally functional organizations. So there's a carry forward effect. Yeah. And that's a really good, I've only seen this once and it was in uh, Indian Beach, uh, Florida, which is just north of West Palm Beach. And I was working with a large group of nonprofit agencies there. Um, and it was a healthcare agency there. And in their bylaws, they had to have at least 50% of uh, um, their board made up of constituents and people that they served. Um, and it gets back to thinking about your bylaws too, or at least you're like, you're giving get policies. And so they all would still give $5, you know, just so there's that financial commitment, but they weren't saying, oh, well, they can't give 5,000. They can't give a thousand, whatever sort of your, your barrier is for your give and get policy. But their key thing was they were the advocates that were actually out in their communities, making sure people were aware of that, you know, healthcare resource and getting more people into the healthcare facility. Uh, but they also provided their perspective in the conversations at the board level around the different decisions that they're making. Um, and so I, it, it, I don't know if it's something that you know people can do, but uh, it's the one thing that I've seen, like it would just made sense. Um, and so it may be easier said than done, dependent upon your board, but you know maybe something to bring up with them as well as you want to look to diversify or what your board, you know, to be representative of the people you serve as well. I have a question for you all while we're here. So I imagine when people are kind of projecting into this idea of, of hiring somebody from a different background and they're scared, it's, it really isn't the hiring process. It's like what happens next. And so I wonder, does it make sense as part of this process? Do people need to think through a little bit of additional training after people come in if they've come from a different background or 
different types of positions may be better suited to people. So are there things that people need to be doing on the employment side to say, this is how I'm smoothing entry. So you talked about like the dollars for the first day. That makes so much sense. I would never have thought of it. Are there other types of training and support we should all be providing? Yeah, I guess it really depends on the, the position that you're hiring for. Um, and I think part of it is just um, an openness, you know, and sort of a candor and, you know, having those conversations and, you know, being up front and, and saying, hey, you have kids, you know, just let us know if you're running into issues uh, with childcare. Uh, and, you know, while we're not, we can't provide childcare, but we can try to be flexible with shifts. Nonetheless, like we're going to do everything we can to work with you uh, just so that there's, there's, a, there's an open line of communication. And if anything, I would say it's more like manager training that's really required uh, to make sure that your managers are open to it uh, and more like having conversations with people, making sure they feel comfortable having it, like bringing up issues that they're having about staying employed, you know, so ultimately they can potentially do something about it. Um, and that's a big part that we help as well. You know, we, we recognize at Rise Kit that your, you know, hiring managers or your managers can't be uh, case managers, you know, in addition to sort of doing their own, you know, work. Um, and so looking at resources that you could refer them to, you know, and saying, hey, while I can't help, we do have, you know, in our, in our handbook, you know, the 15 places that you can go for resources, you, or you can say you can call 211, and, you know, they might be able to help. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that you can be more proactive and, you know, being, making people feel comfortable and also, you know, lifting up uh, resources that can help people in overcoming really key barriers um, to staying in employment. I think that was a great answer to the question. Do we have, have any other questions from the crowds? <laughs> hey. Um, well, thank you everyone for all of your time today. Thank you for kind of listening to us you know, talk as talking heads um, on this Thursday morning. We really appreciate all the input and all the um, conversations that we had. And if you have any other questions for us, our emails are on the screen. Um, and we love, we love new friends. So. Travis, anything else you want to add yeah. to that? I just want to say thank you, Holly and Travis. This was such a wealth of information, gave yes, me so much I'm to great. think about. And I'm sure for all the nonprofits that are going to be accessing this, it's just really helpful. Yeah, thank you all for having us. It was great to see some familiar faces uh, and, and some new faces as well. And Jeffrey, yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciated your insights that you shared. Um, and so thank you all. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Cheers. All right. Talk to you all later.